the other four <laughs> again. I was very disappointed not to have been here last week for lots of reasons, but anyway, here we go. So I do want to, I do want to talk about listening to God, about hearing the voice of God. Um, and that's up. It is now. It is now. Yeah, I just got to check whether this works or not. Okay. Yeah.
the gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he's brought them out, all his own, he goes ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. We are his sheep. He is our sheep. We are made so that we can hear him. We know his voice. We know his voice. So the question is, are we listening? Now, we know that listening is a bit of a tricky thing because all of us have said, you're not listening to me. <laughs> every parent and every teacher and all of the rest of everybody knows that there are times when we're not being listened to. And the reason is, the reason is that there's no outcome. It's not just the words, is it? It's if that person hasn't listened to you, <laughs> then something has not happened that you want to see. So as a mum, you're saying to your kids, you know, they're going off doing their thing, oh, you weren't listening to me, your room's still not tidy, or whatever it happens to be. Because the outcome has, you haven't seen the outcome, nothing's happened. So listening is not just hearing the words when, you, when we're wanting to hear God's voice, it's, it's together with obeying, right? Listening and obeying, there's got to be an outcome. Now, the reason, one of the reasons that I want to do this is just, I've got to share a little bit this morning. So, first of all, here's our warning scripture. Warning um, in, in Hebrews chapter 2, it's a warning to pay attention. It says, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we've heard, so that we do not drift away. For well, since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? Now, the reason for all this is I just need to do a little bit of sharing. I've been doing a bit of drifting stammering because I don't really um, I've been doing a bit of drifting over the, over the recent months so I've had all my excuses, I've had health issues and there's been a couple of little business things going on and some minor family issues minor family issues are the ones you want if you've got to get family issues better than major family issues but especially my health at the beginning of the year I broke my wrist and then I got flu that seemed to go on forever and ever and ever and then there was more stuff last week that seemed to be one thing after the other. And when that happened, I got a bit, you know, just a bit low. I was physically low, and when that happens, other things go on too. And so, that's all my excuses. But this Hebrews verse does not say, unless you've got loads of really, really good excuses. It says, don't drift. Listen, and don't drift. So the way I gave in was to do my thing. I've always loved really, really decent stories. I love a really good book or a good movie or so forth. And, oh, Netflix. There are some cool series on Netflix. They're heaps fun. And, and, and being that sort of person and being lying on the lounge, moaning a little and having a Panadol, I got a bit involved in some of the very long series on Netflix. Now, this next little bit's a bit hard to describe. I, I can't really describe it exactly, but it, because it's how I felt. But when I was deeply involved in those series, that I could feel a bit of a pull. You know, God speaks to you. But there was a bit of a pull in my spirit. And I knew, I knew, I mean, I didn't want to look, but I knew that God was saying to me, come on, you've had enough of that. Come away from that now. And because I'm his sheep and I know his voice, and I would say, okay, I'll just finish this one. <laughs> and, uh, and then I'd do a bit more coughing and I'd have another pan at all. <laughs> well, I'm allowed to go, oh, I'll just, just one more. <laughs> and God doesn't give up on us. He tries all sorts of ways. And in the middle of that, I got a call from, my, from, a, from one of my, my sons. And we were just having a conversation. And I said to him, you know, because I'm in movies lately. And, uh, I said, do you... Do you, do you use Netflix? And he said, oh, I have been, but I don't, I think I'm going to get rid of it because there's not many decent movies and I hate series. <laughs> oh, <laughs> why do you hate series? And he said, because they're long and they waste your life. <laughs> I said, okay, so how's the weather? <laughs> 
you know, God will, God will use whatever, you know, whomever, to pull you away from that thing. Because he's our good shepherd and he will have us in his path. And we know his voice. And you know, voices are an amazing illustration um, from our scripture because they're so distinctive. You know, um, when my children phone, I don't have to ask them who they are. I know their voice. And if, you know, many people in this room, if I phone, I don't have to ask you who you are. I know your voice. God's not made two voices alike. But we know. We know one another's voices. And if we can do that, my goodness, you know, we know God's voice. And he knows our voices very, very well. And the sheep picture, the sheep illustration works marvellously well too. Um, my son in Victoria, he's got a little farm, has got a few ewes and they lamb in the winter. I think he had about eight this year and six of them lamb. They usually have two lambs, sometimes they don't, so that's say 10 or 12. 10 or 12 little bouncy, fluffy things that have got springs in their legs, they're so funny. And I can't tell the difference between any of those little fluffy, bouncy things by looking at them, let alone listening to them. You know, they're a pest at night when you can't sleep and they're all yelling. But one of those ewes only has to raise her voice and there's only the one or the two will go to her. They know exactly. They know exactly. You know, those voices are those voices are so distinctive. And you've all heard stories about the Middle Eastern shepherds that drive their flocks the way the Australian shepherds do. We don't call them shepherds, but they don't drive their flocks. They lead them with their voice. They speak to them and they sing to them and their sheep follow. It's a marvellous, it's a marvellous illustration. And so he's our good shepherd and we are his sheep. Jesus' people, we know his voice. Now, I know you expect me to say that we can hear God's voice by reading our Bible, because it's true. It's true. But, you know, there are ways and ways. And, you know, this really is just a book, right? It's black print on a white. Oh, this is a bit grey, but it's black print on a white page. Now, the truths in this book are eternal and holy, but not pages, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, I do the longer readings, I tend to do the longer readings in, um, in the evenings, and sometimes when I read, what happens? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. <clears throat> and I'll sometimes, sometimes, I go back and I search, and I say to the Lord, where are the gems for this evening? And sometimes I don't do that. But when, if and when I do, um, sometimes there's gems and sometimes there isn't. And you know, it's a marvellous thing. It's a marvellous thing to go back and search and find the gems, find the, the treasures that God's wanting to communicate to me. Now, the words may have been heard, but if I don't hear with my heart, you know, we listen with our heart, not with our ears. We use our ears, but you know, the real listening, the one I've been alluding to previously, goes on in the heart. Have a look at who I was. Have a look at the difference between these two. So here's Exodus, where Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron. Okay, hardening his heart and listening, not listening. And in Acts, one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a worshipper of God, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. So listening and heart go together. It's a lovely illustration, isn't it? Um, some, of, some of the teaching that I want to share today is from a famous preacher who's been in heaven quite a while now to receive um, his, his reward and to have a really, really nice time with Jesus. So I, I hope you enjoy some of the, the teaching of his that I would like to share with you. So the question for us is, what is it? that God is wanting from us now. So to answer that, I've got to uh, go back um, in time a little bit. What this teacher taught was that God always wanted the same thing from us, right down from the beginning of time, from his people to hear and obey. So, here we go. There were three great ages. Uh, I think I've gone back, have I? Okay, there were three great ages in the church. The church calls them dispensations, 
And what that means is God's supply, it's the way God provided for his people. So there were the time of the fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and there was the time of the law in the prophets. And there's the time of the gospel, the age of grace. So I'm going to look fairly briefly at the first two. Now, the supply in each of those three has been very, very different. But there's been that one clear and outstanding and very powerful requirement that's common to all three that I've already mentioned, and that is the requirement to listen to God for God's people and to do what he says. So in the first age, the fathers, um, in Exodus 15, 26, um, God said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Um, I'll just stick with that for one for a moment. So this one clearly says that there's healing in hearing God. Now, at this particular time, they had just come out of slavery in Egypt. So God had done this massive miracle. They were slaves and God had um, rescued them. They had escaped from Pharaoh and his army and they'd come through the Red Sea and in the process God had destroyed their enemies and so having come through, they were praising God and worshipping God. But it was only a very short time later that they ran into a problem with some water and they started grumbling almost, almost immediately. And Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you're to say. This is what you're to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nation you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you are to speak to the Israelites. But did they? Did they um, obey God fully and no. keep his... No, they didn't. Keep his, <laughs> no, they didn't. They grumbled. And if you would like to explore that... Oh, I'll just point what I've got next. Um, Exodus 23. If you listen carefully to what the angel says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and I will oppose you those who oppose you. But they didn't. They didn't. They grumbled. If you read that, if you go back and read that, you'll see lots and lots of grumbling. And then if you'd like to explore that a little bit further, particularly in Deuteronomy 28, it's quite a scary chapter. There's um, a lot of if clauses and um, a whole stack of absolutely marvellous, wonderful blessings um, if people listen to God. And right up against it, parallel to it, um, there's, a, there's a very big list of curses. That's a harsh word, isn't it? That's what they are. You know, you can't hold back from that. Now, the list of curses is quite blood curdling. It's, it's enough to get you to make, uh, I mean, pardon, enough to make you to get the point, really. But did they? Did they get the point? And did they do what God said? No, they did not. And then God's type of supply his provision changed, and there was the second age, the age of the law. Now, in this... So, that was the fathers, and now we're up to the law. And this is where the prophets came and spoke to the people. Now, there is so much in the prophets, most particularly the major prophets, but some of the minor too, where these sent men of God are saying, Listen, listen to God and do what he says. Um, you can open the Old Testament at almost any major prophet. I actually had a go at doing this. Um, I opened up Isaiah and it says, Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers. That's not good, right? Children who are corrupted, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel, and have turned away backward. I open to Jeremiah. O oh, generation, see the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel or a land of darkness? What do my people say? We are lords. We will come no more to you. 
Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. And so did the people of the Lord listen to God? No, they did not. And in chapter 25 of Jeremiah, Oh, that's seven. I'll read this one. For when I brought your ancestors out of Egypt and spoke to them, I did not just give them commands about burnt offerings and sacrifices, but I gave them this command. Obey me, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. Walk in obedience to all I command you, that it may go well. But, but, they did not listen or pay attention. Instead, they followed the stubborn inclinations of their evil hearts, and they went backward and not forward. And so... In the time of the fathers and in the time of the Lord, God called his people and called his people and called them and they didn't listen. They just never listened. And so we come to the next marvellous and wonderful age, the age of the gospel, the age of the good news of Jesus Christ, the age of grace. The age of grace. Grace is a marvellous thing. I've got a quote from Dallas Willard, who's also in heaven, having a nice time with Jesus. And he says, Christians use up far more grace than non-Christians. We chew it up like rocket fuel. <laughs> oh, that's glorious, isn't it? You can just see grace pouring out of heaven and we just chew it right up. <laughs> we chew up grace like rocket fuel. Now, although there's a very deep truth in that and grace is poured out on God's people in this wonderful age of God's provision, God's requirement to listen to him has not changed. In fact, because of grace, we have far less excuse. We have far less excuse. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? You know, to think that after all that, through the age of the fathers and through the age of the prophets, now Jesus comes, what a great salvation. He comes as a little baby and he lives his life here on earth uh, to give us, to, give, to pour out grace on us. And he gives his life to pay the price for our sins. He pours out grace on us and then goes to heaven and leads us the Holy Spirit. He pours out grace on us. What will become of us if we ignore so great a salvation? We think we want to hear him. He wants us to hear him so much more. So how do we go about hearing God's voice? You know, we suffer terribly from distraction, worldly distraction. We suffer from spiritual deafness. We have an enemy who works day and night to distract us. How do we go about hearing God's voice? Well, the first thing is to know that we know the truth, that he is our good shepherd and we can know his voice. We do know his voice. So being sure that's the first thing. So once we know that, we can start to look for particulars. So here are three features of knowing God's voice. First of all, it's personal. The way the word that was spoken to me when I was saved in the dream, it was personal, it was just for me. The way the little voice in Vivian's head was just for her. When God speaks to you, it's for you. And it's intangible. It's not something that we can point to and show others. It's not something that we can pin down. And it's present. It's now. It's a, it's a word for us now. Because, you know, now is all that we have. You know, the past's gone. And the future is entirely in God's hands. Um, you know, so many people, we all, we all plan and we have to I'm not saying that's a, that's a wrong thing, but we plan so certainly. You know, we, we, I can't even be certain that I'm going to wake up in the morning. You know, did you know that waking up is God's gift to you? Did you know that you're the only person that you can't wake up? I wake up at about, oh, more or less if I'm left alone, Mom, more or less the same time every morning, you know, within 10 minutes or so. But that's not my choice. That's not my choice. That's, if I want to wake up at a particular time, I've got to set the alarm. I can't do. I can't just, you know, dial in 6:30. It won't work. I'll, I'll wake up. <laughs> you know, I have to set the alarm. You know, so now is all we've got. You know, the future is God's business. So, it's personal. It's intangible. 
and it's present. And there's one result. And the result is faith. Well, how does that work? Well, earlier I said that when I read my Bible, sometimes I just read and very little happens. But then there's that precious moment when I listen and I truly hear my heart becomes engaged. And I can hear in my heart what God's saying. And the word uh, light, shines a light somehow and just leaps out at me. And what happens then? Faith comes. Romans 10, 17, I've printed it twice, one in NIV and one in the Passion Translation. This is the one we're used to hearing. Faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. But I do love this one. It's very, very beautifully written. Faith, then, is birthed in a heart that responds to God's anointed utterance of the anointed one. Faith is birthed in a listening heart, right? Faith is birthed in you from listening carefully. So, what happens then? What's the outcome? Remember, it has to have an outcome. What happens then? So there's been a little light shining in my heart because faith has been birthed. What happens then? You know, it's miraculous. That's a little miracle. Because at that moment, something, something of my sinful self is washed away. In, 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 from church language, we say we're washed by the water of the word. You know, and at that moment, something changes in me. Something of my attitude, which may come out in my behavior, I hope it does. What happens then? Well, it may take time, it might not, but maybe someone will notice. Maybe, some, maybe I'll, I'll get to do something that I would not have done otherwise. Or say some words to somebody encouraging me that I may not have done otherwise. And then when that happens, just the tiniest spot in the world changes. And the kingdom of God is at work. And then that little bit spreads, and it spreads just like yeast. Remember the parable about um, the kingdom of God being like yeast in the loaf? You know, that loaf just puffs up and puffs up, you know, nobody can stop that once the kingdom of God invades earth, you know. I've got a quote from John Ortberg, he's alive. He said, <laughs> he says, salvation is not about getting heaven into us. Um, I said the wrong way around. Salvation is not at all about getting us into heaven. It's much more about getting heaven into us. It's much more about getting heaven into us. That's the kingdom of God at work, like yeast, and it's growing and it's growing. Because there's a distinctive lifestyle that comes from having a listening heart. How can we get hold of that more and more? What can we do? Well, it's a skill we can practice. Um, there are four things to practice. I've done them in twos. And I've just written them and put the scriptures. So I'll read a couple of the scriptures. So we need to be attentive and we need to be humble. We need to have attention and humility. I'll read a couple of the scriptures from there. I think I will. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ears to my words. Pay attention and turn your ear to the sayings of the wise. Apply your heart to what I teach. There are lots more like that. And the second two are that we need time and quietness. For many of us, those two things are quite rare, but we need some time and quietness. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. And 62, Psalm 62 verse 1 says, Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from Him. Sometimes, Putting ourselves aside for just a short time or a long time, if you have that, is a spiritual discipline. It's not something that we particularly want to do. Our flesh doesn't want to do that. We can always think of 30 other things we could, could be doing. But to just spend some quiet time and discipline our minds and our spirits to spend some time listening to God. So Christians who do the work of listening carefully will develop a distinctive lifestyle. Jesus had a distinctive lifestyle. He had faith, he had a listening heart. Now, there's, um, I've got a scripture, Isaiah 50, verses 4 to 7. I'm not going to go there, but if you would like to read about Jesus' distinctive lifestyle, Isaiah 50, 
verses 4 to 7. And his lifestyle came from continually hearing the voice of God. He said it was like bread to him. Matthew 4.4, 4, he answered, uh, this is when he's answering the devil, and Jesus answered, the scriptures say, bread alone will not satisfy, but true life is found in every word which constantly, constantly goes forth from God's mouth. God is constantly speaking to us. He speaks to us all the time. He wants us to listen to him so very much more that we want to hear him. But if as his sheep we do all that, we do the work, how can we really know that we know that it is God's voice that we have heard? Because we have an enemy. We have an enemy and there are counterfeits. You know, there are counterfeits everywhere. You know, just at this point, I will just encourage you that, oh, there's just so much stuff out there, especially um, for little children in news agents, you know, there's boxes about how to make witches potions and all sorts of stuff like that, I would just encourage you to be on the alert for your children's sake. But um, um, all of the markets have witches' booths and mm -hmm. you know witches are just people that Jesus died on the cross for, you know, but he does not like their practices. Jesus does not like their practices. And I just want to encourage you to stay to stay from far, far from that stuff. And if you happen to have if you happen to have any lucky charms or amulets or anything like that. I would encourage you to part with those. Um, it's all over the place. I was in the in a country town with one of my children, and there was a cafe in the in the main street, and it was all done up in witches' stuff. It was all painted in black, and there were broomsticks holding up the, the umbrellas and so forth. And it was called witches' broom. You know, they, it was all a bit of a bit of a laugh. And my son, knowing me well, <laughs> he said, "Well, let's go in there and have a cup of coffee." <laughs> And I, oh no, he says, you can't, no, no, you can't go in. <laughs> and I said, well, I can, but the roof would cave in. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, do you want to go in? And he said, oh no, oh no, because he was scared what I might say to someone. <laughs> There's another one up here, he said. <laughs> so I would, I would encourage you to stay away from those places if, it, if they worry you at all. You know, there's a lot of new age stuff about. So how do we know? That, um, that we know, that we're hearing God's voice. So here are um, three ways, three ways in which we can be absolutely sure. Um, so it needs to be in agreement with scripture, in spirit and in tenor, you know, in tone, in spirit. The Holy Spirit brings God's voice. He's the author of scripture and he never contradicts himself. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Truth's shining light. I wonder if I've got this one. No, I've got this one, sorry. So truth's shining light guides me in my choices and decisions. The revelation of your word makes my pathway clear. So it needs to line up with scripture. Now the second one are circumstances. Now you remember the story of Jeremiah. Um, where he had been, um, where he had been preaching to the people and preaching and preaching and preaching, and had they listened? No, they had not. And so near the end, it was something like God said, "Okay, I've had enough of this. Um, the Babylonians are going to come and take all these terrible, not listening people away." And so they did. Now Jeremiah was in a terrible spot. He was in jail, and he was the land being raised, and his people were being taken away. And you can imagine he wasn't too cheery about the whole thing. But the word of the Lord came to him and said, um, this particular man, Hanamel, I think his name was, was it? Um, Hanamel, something like that, son of Shalom, your uncle, is going to come to you and say, buy my field at Anatoth, because as a nearest relative, it's your right and duty to buy it. So here's the people being taken away and killed and the land's on fire. And God says to Jeremiah, you should invest in real estate right now. <laughs> so Jeremiah, being a very good listener that he was, just held it right there. <laughs> and in due course, just as the Lord had said, his cousin came and said, buy my field at Anatop in the territory of Benjamin, since it is your right. And Jeremiah says, I knew this was the word of the Lord. And so I bought the field from my cousin. 
and Hanamel weighed out for him 17 shekels of silver. So he went right ahead and did what God said in spite of the circumstances. So if the word of the Lord comes to you and says to do something a bit surprising or totally outrageous, you should wait for confirmation, right? Just like Jeremiah. So confirmation is a very good thing, circumstances. And the last one, God's peace in your heart. Please don't wipe that one off. It's a, it's a lovely thing to have God's peace in your heart. Um, Colossians 3, 15 says, Let your heart be always guided by the peace of the Anointed One who called you to peace, who called you to peace as part of His one body. And always be thankful. Always be thankful. So, there we have it. We want to hear God's voice. He wants, to, he wants us to hear him far more than we want to hear him. But you know, he has put his heart within us. He is our good shepherd and we are his sheep and we can hear his voice. And so I would encourage you to do that good work of hearing God's voice. So there we go. Practice. Check it out. And always be thankful. Amen. Amen.